Um, welcome everyone from the ISS community to our um, next uh, ISS professional development webinar. Um, I'm really pleased uh, that this organize that this webinar came together and that Justin Jacques um, was uh, willing to come and talk to us about data visualization. Um, it's going to be a great hour. Um, just a quick word, um, in addition to the, the, the slides being accessible to you, this recording will be um, put up on our ISS uh, YouTube channel um, so that you can view the recording again later um, and share it with others as you wish. Um, so with that said, um, let me just tell you a little bit about Justin. Um, Justin Jacques is the Visualization Librarian here at the University of Michigan, where I am as well. Uh, he completed a PhD in Media Studies at the European Graduate School and a Master's of Science of Information from the University of Michigan. Uh, he currently works on an IMLS-funded grant uh, that is working to foster a national conversation around data visualization in libraries. So I can think of no one better to come and talk to us today about data visualization beyond tools, principles, and approaches. And with that, Justin, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you both. Um, I'm really excited to be with you all here today to talk a little bit about sort of the way that I think and kind of teach about data visualization, um, especially as I've sort of been trying to do it more and more instead of teaching directly in software, but teaching people, um, especially students and researchers and faculty, techniques and approaches that they can apply in whatever software it is they're using. So what I'm going to sort of go through today with you is some of the, the kind of the ways that I approach visualization and the ways that I um, teach it. So I'm hoping to have about 15 minutes at the end so we can have a you know, discussion and I'd love any questions that you all have about any of this. So one of the, the sort of the first things that I try to do when I'm teaching about data visualization is to get people to think sort of as a visualization as a way to take data and map it to space rather than a necessarily technological or computational process. So I really love the work of this artist, Mark Lombardi, who was active in the 90s. And he would do all of this uh, research on, you know, what we might call conspiracies, not in the sense of conspiracy theories, but more in terms of actual governing conspiracies like um, Iran Contra and the savings and loan scandals in the 80s. And he would do this research on sort of who was paying whom and who was working with whom. Um, and he would write it all out on three by five cards. And then he would, he would sort of arrange everything and draw these diagrams of sort of what we, you know, come to expect as network diagrams. But the thing I really love about them is that he would draw them just by hand with pen and ink after laying out these three by five cards. And I think it's such a nice reminder that the sort of the process of taking information and data and mapping it to visual space is not one that necessarily requires a computer. And so oftentimes when I'm consulting with people about data visualization, one of the first things that I do is pull out a large sheet of paper so that we can sketch what they want to do. Because I think so much of the software that we use, especially if it's Excel or these kind of things that are a little bit more user friendly, is that they they very quickly limit the number of options that you have for mapping the data. You know, Excel has whatever the 10 or 12 built-in graph types, and that's sort of all you have. And once you start, you know, if, if that's your starting spot, then you sort of quickly get locked into those things. And so starting with pen and paper can be a really nice way to figure out what the most appropriate way to represent data is and then go to the software to figure out how best to represent it. And so one of the, the sort of the places I really like to, to think of, or to start when thinking about visualization and teaching is this sort of both long and short history of data visualization. And I think it's really interesting sort of how long humans have had all of the tools of data visualization and then how sort of late in human history data visualization emerged. So humans started making maps thousands and thousands of years ago. This is a, you're looking at right now a, a cave painting from France that's about, I think, 15,000 to 17,000 years old. 
And it looks like, you know, it's just some, some bulls, some animals, but you can see that there are these little black dots above and sort of in each of the bowls. And these early cave paintings were actually star maps, so they were showing where constellations were. And so humans start thousands and thousands of years ago making maps of the stars and then slowly start making maps of the earth. But it isn't really until the 17th century that we start sort of the sort of map making turns into what we know as data visualization. And even data has a very sort of long history. This is a, um, a clay tablet from Mesopotamia from about 3000 BC showing beer rations for a small village. So you can see, um, I mean, I can't read it. Maybe some of you are able to, to read it, but um, each of the sort of cells, you know, has some data in it about how much beer each family is supposed to get. And it looks, you know, I could almost imagine it kind of looking like a, an Excel spreadsheet or something like that. Um, so, you know, we have this, this really long history of maps and of data, but it's not actually until the the seventeenth century that we that sort of the the kind of the geographic or astral space of the map gets replaced with abstract variables or abstract data gets put on a map one of the the kind of the first things that sort of starts looking like a data visualization is this graph from Lagrin from sixteen forty four showing estimates of the diff of the the distance in uh, degrees longitude from Toledo to Rome. And you can see that there are a bunch of different sort of scientists listed here with their, their estimations. And then this lower arrow here shows the actual estimate. So in, you know, it's sort of a, a graph with just a single axis and these, these numbers on them, but it's this visual representation of uncertainty. Um, but one of the first sort of examples of putting abstract information on a map comes slightly later, and this is 1686, this uh, wind map made by Edmund Haley. And you can see here, it's a, you know, it's a standard map of the, of the world with prevailing wind currents on it. So this is really one of the first examples of, you know, someone taking the kind of the, the geographic space and putting abstract data on it. So visualization comes out of this sort of this long history of cartography and map making, but it, it sort of, at least to me, surprisingly takes thousands and thousands of years before anyone really puts abstract data on a map. Um, and interestingly, the same year that Haley made this map, he also made one of the first examples of what you know, we would sort of, I think, traditionally understand as a data visualization with an X and Y axis. So this one is not based on actual existing data, but rather shows um, a theoretical relationship between elevation and air pressure. So you can see that as elevation goes up, then air pressure goes down, and Haley's sort of showing the, the theoretical curve here. But so really in this year, 1686, we get the sort of the first, um, you know, use of the X and Y axis first in the map to sort of show some abstract data with wind currents. And then in this, in this map of air or this visualization of air pressure, we see the X and Y being replaced, not as, as geographic space, but as the theoretical space of these two variables and their interaction. So one of the reasons I like to sort of tell students about the sort of history of data visualization is that I think it, it provides this sort of context where we can think about data visualization, not as this necessarily completely new and unexplored thing or this thing that's, that's you know, coexistent exclusively with computation and computers and the large data sets we're dealing with now, but this longer history of human sort of making maps and then trying to explain abstract relationships. And I think it, it helps sort of get students thinking more abstractly about visualization and how it is that they want to show data. And I love showing students, um, you know, I show them these early examples, but then I really love showing them things from the 19th century. I think the 19th century, you know, is there's this sort of explosion of demographic data <coughs> and statistics that that individuals started sort of, you know, really trying to struggle with this, 
this sort of this first you know big data era and how to represent data in meaningful ways and one of the things i really like about a lot of these 19th century examples is that first of all there there weren't computers in Excel telling people what to, to do with their data. So they were just taking it, um, you know, and, and, and representing it in the way that they thought both most communicated it. And even more than that, a lot of the sort of standard charts that we use now, like pie charts and bar charts, had not been in invented. So these early data visualizers were really sort of starting at ground zero, looking at the, the data they had and trying to figure out the sort of the best and the most appropriate way to represent it. So I think one of my, my favorite examples are these, what we usually call coxcomb charts that um, uh, Florence Nightingale made. And, and if, if for those of you who aren't, who don't remember or don't know who Florence Nightingale was, she was the, the person who essentially started modern nursing. But in addition to being a nurse, she was actually also a, a statistician. And so these graphs that you're looking at now were based on some data that she was able to collect on deaths in the British Army in the Crimean War. So let me just walk through a little bit and then I can sort of explain why I like these so much. So the, um, the red wedges, all of the wedges sort of start at the, um, at the origin. And it's not, unlike a pie chart, what sort of determines the magnitude is not the the angle of the wedge, but actually how far out from the origin it goes. And so they all are measured out from the origin. So the red wedge shows deaths from wounds. So what we would traditionally think of as battlefield deaths. Um, the black wedges show deaths from all other causes. And then the blue wedges are labeled here as zytomatic diseases or what we might call infections. Um, and so what Florence Nightingale did with this data and then with these visualizations was attempt to show that while the generals in the army were really focused on, you know, what was going on on the battlefield itself, the vast, vast majority of deaths were happening because of poor sanitation, infections, and these kind of things in field hospitals and, and then soldiers who were being treated on the battlefield. And so she took this data and these visualizations to the army to essentially try to convince them to invest in proper sanitary practices, to develop nursing, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think what's so you know, amazing about these visualizations is they take some data that was presumably available to the army, but allow us, you know, and at the time the, the generals in the army to see something that was was sort of apparent but no one actually thought to look for and so they you know they so clearly tell this story that the real sort of loss of the the vast majority of the loss of of life in the war was not happening on the battlefield and so sort of out of this work in crimea um we get the the modern practice of nursing and this this realization that sanitation in hospitals is incredibly important in the way that you know that that things are cleaned and taken care of and wounds are cleaned, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, I, I think the thing that I, I ultimately like about this is the, the ability of Nightingale to sort of take the data and tell this really interesting and, and prescient story um, in order to, to convince people to see something that otherwise they were unable to see. So, you know, I think in, in that regard, one of the, the best things that one can, can do in terms of, of visualization, either creating visualizations or teaching vi visualization, is to be very clear with ourselves about what the purpose of creating a visualization is. And so I like to sort of think of a couple different reasons that we might create visualizations. So the first one, is not necessarily to, to communicate something about our data, but just to understand its basic structure. So there's this somewhat uh, famous set of data sets called ANSCOM's quartet. And you can see it here. It's these four sets of X and Y pairs. And if we run sort of standard summary statistics on them, they all end up looking effectively the same. The mean and the variance of both X and Y is very similar. Um, the correlation, and if we run, <coughs> excuse me, if we run a, a linear regression on them, they appear to be similar data sets. But as soon as we graph these data sets, we can see 
that in fact they have very different structures. Um, the first data set looks like a sort of standard linear relationship with um, a little bit of noise. The other ones appear to have slightly different structures. The second one is, is a nonlinear relationship. The third one is possibly a different linear relationship with an outlier. And the fourth one is, is really just a vertical line with an outlier. So I think the nice thing, and this was Anscom developed this in this data, this set of data sets in the 80s to demonstrate this principle. But the basic idea is that just by you know graphing our data, we get a sense of the structure and it might give us some different ideas about how we want to analyze or treat the data going forward. So the first sort of purpose for data visualization is just understanding the kind of the basic structure of our data. The next thing that I think data visualization is really good at and is often underappreciated is sort of for checking our data, making sure that our processes are proceeding the way that we expect them to or that they're, um, you know, that the data is in fact the data that we think we're working with. So there's this really nice um, example from this Candle article where they take um, uh, some friendship data from Facebook. And so you can see it's one person's friends and all the linkages between their friends. So we get this kind of standard network diagram and you can see each of the, the little circles is a person uh, and there's a line if they're connected. So we have, you know, sort of one big cluster. Over on the left, we have a small cluster. Maybe this is the person's like, uh, you know, friends from high school. And then in the lower right, we have a much smaller cluster. So you could imagine maybe that's some like aunts and uncles or something that, you know, are, are on Facebook and, and follow this person. So looking at, at this representation of the visualization, you know, I think everything seems sort of as we would expect it. This looks like a standard um, sort of network of friends and friends. But what the researchers did was they took the data and they showed it as a heat map. So what, what it's, it's showing here in this visualization is each of the people who are represented in the data set are arranged based on their ID number across both the X and Y axis. And then if two people are, are friends, they get a blue dot. And if they're not friends, they get a white dot. And so here it looks like there's something, you know, very clearly wrong with the data. There's, you can see in the lower right hand corner, there's this big white spot. And what the researchers realized was that the Facebook API that they were using to pull this data um, was in fact not giving them all the data. It was returning 5,000 records and then it had a silent failure. So they had no idea that they weren't getting all of the data. But when you see it in, in this format, it's really clear that something is wrong with the data. And so data visualization, you know, I think can be a nice sort of way in process of any sort of data analysis, just to check and make sure that the data is, is the way that you expect it to be. Um, so, right, so we have exploration, confirmation, um, and then the final one is communication. So, you know, we know something about the data and we want to uh, communicate the story to other people or communicate, you know, what it is that the data is trying to tell us. And I'm sure a fair number of you have already seen um, this Menard graph of Napoleon's march to Moscow, but I'd like to show it um, just because I think it's such a clear example. Um, I won't spend too much time describing it, but you can see that the, the width of the tan band represents the size of Napoleon's army as he uh, approached Moscow. And it starts out with 422,000 troops. And by the time they get to Moscow, it's only about 100,000 troops. And then the black line shows the retreating army. So you can see first they sort of go south. Um, and, and this is actually, you know, it's an actual map. You can see there's a scale bar there and rivers. And what happened, they tried to go south to get to warmer weather, but they encountered resistance amongst peasants um, who kept driving the army north into colder weather. And you can also see here about one third um, from the left over to the right, there's a place where there are about 50,000 troops and they try to cross a river. And I think what happened was the ice broke and a large number of, of soldiers fell into the water and died of hypothermia. So by the time they get back to France, only about 10,000 of the initial 422,000 soldiers set out. And Menard was producing this in 1869. So as Napoleon III was kind of considering his own imperial adventures, and it really tells, I think, this very kind of stark uh, 
anti-war message, you know, the, the sort of the folly of Napoleon's attack on Moscow. So I think again, you know, this is this is this beautiful sort of chart that one couldn't really produce in Excel or something like that. And I think it's a it's another really nice example of of these sort of 19th century examples um, and how good they are at taking the data and taking the most interesting elements of them and communicating them. You know, one thing I really like about this is it's a map, but most of the other sort of signifiers of it being a map have been stripped away so that we really kind of focus on the most interesting aspects of the data. And I think as we sort of talk about principles, this will come out a little bit more. Um, but in general, I try to encourage students to think about what are the most sort of important elements and then what can be removed um, to sort of tell that story the most clearly as possible or as clearly as possible. So, all right. Um, so there you have the, the sort of the three purposes, the exploration, confirmation and communication. You know, and I think being kind of clear with oneself um, about what one is trying to do can be one of the, you know, sort of can be really important for starting off any sort of visualization and asking, you know, knowing what questions it is that you're trying to ask. So in a little bit, what I want to talk about is sort of some kind of like best principles that you can or best practices that you can use for creating or teaching data visualizations. But first, I sort of want to take a, a slight detour um, to sort of talk about some of the options that one has for for creating graphs So not talking really about, you know, bar charts, scatter plots and those kind of things, but sort of more abstractly about what it is that, you know, what resources we have available to us for creating data visualizations. So I think one of the, um, for me, one of the best sort of sources for thinking about this is this work from this uh, French cartographer named Jacques Bertin, who published this book in 1964 entitled The Semiology of Graphics. And it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful book where he sort of goes through and tries to define sort of all of the possibilities for creating maps and graphs and, and networks. Um, and, but the one thing that, that I find most helpful about it is sort of his <coughs> attempt to pull out kind of what he calls the visual variables. Um, and so what he says is he says, okay, there are two positional variables. He kind of sets aside 3D visualization and, 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 or anima and animation. Those could be separate questions. Um, but in terms of two dimensional sort of static visualizations, he says, okay, you have two positional variables, the X and the Y. So, you know, where things are, in space. And, and the thing I like about that is, you know, automatically you can see that if you're making a map, you've used those two positional variables already to represent geography. So we have the two positional variables. And then he says, you also have six, what he calls retinal variables. So those are size, shape, orientation. You can see here, it's, you know, how you rotate things. Um, color, so, you know, the, the actual sort of whether it's green or blue or red, um, texture, and then value. So, you know, we might think of value being light to dark as being the same thing as color, but I actually really like the way he sort of pulls it out as a, a separate variable, and you'll see why in, in just a second. So he says, okay, this is, you know, this is really it. You have these eight visual variables, and, and this is, you know, you can take any data you want and map them to these eight things, but that's essentially it. And so I, I like that it kind of helps, you know, articulate the fact that every visualization is a choice. You're choosing which ones of these you're gonna use and which elements in the data you're gonna map to which of these visual variables. And then he has this sort of beautiful visualization of visualization that I really like. And so he sort of shows what each of these things can be used for. So he has, um, the, the left two columns are association and selection. So these are what we would normally think of as qualitative variables. So association is that you can see what things are similar and selection is you can see what things are different. And then the right two columns are what we would think of as quantitative. So in the first one, we have order. We can tell you know, when something is bigger or smaller, but we might not be able to necessarily tell the ratio. And then the final one, he has this quantity and that's where we can see that something is you know twice as large or three times as large or something else and so what he shows here right is that um, in addition to the two positional variables size is really the only one of these that can effectively show quantity 
There are a few other that allow us to see val to see order. So value, we can see order. You know, we can see in a choropleth map, we can see the sort of the rank of of things. But it's actually really hard looking just at light to dark to tell. You know, even though you can map these things that way, it's really hard to tell that something's twice as dark as something else. And so color. So the the nice thing about the distinction between color and value is that value can show us order, whereas color can really only show us um, categories or selection as he calls it here. And then you can see getting down to orientation and shape, these can show us very little. So the thing I really like about um, teaching Bertin, and, and there's a lot more that's in, in the full book, but I really like this sort of this description of these um, two positional variables and these six retinal variables, because it sort of, it, it shows you or a student when they're working with data, you know, what the sort of options they have and what they could potentially um, do with them. And I think that sort of just showing how, how limited it is oftentimes helps with a question that, that I get, and, and actually one that I had just the other day where I was talking to a professor. Um, and you know, they had all of these sort of interacting variables and they were saying, how am I gonna show all of these things? You know, and I think by sort of talking them through this, it helped them realize that it's you know, impossible to show 10 variables at the same time. I mean, you could sort of cut them together with different graphs and you know show subsets and those kind of things but it, it requires a sort of a choice of, of which of these variables you're going to use and how you're going to use them all right so i think with with that in mind we can lay out a couple of sort of principles or best practices that can be applied to to data visualization um, and one thing i should say before we look at these examples uh, what i'm going to show you now a lot of these examples are bad examples and i think one of the um actually best ways you can learn about data visualization or teach data visualization is to see lots of bad examples. The good examples look really good, but it's really hard to know exactly how to reproduce them. And I think the nice thing about bad examples is it makes it clear sort of what, you know, what's gone wrong and how one can improve their own visualizations. All right, so the first principle is that one should try to increase data density as much as possible. So what data density means essentially is um, the number of numbers represented per square inch or per centimeter. So obviously you can increase this too much and, you know, and the graph becomes unreadable. But on the other hand, if there's not enough data density, it's really hard for a graph to say anything interesting. Um, so for example, you know, I assume that, that even though I can't hear you all, that most of you would agree that the chart on the top is a more interesting and effective data visualization than the one on the bottom, right? Because there's more data being represented. The one on the bottom, you can, it might not be clear, but along the, the zero where Y equals zero, you can see there's a line. Um, but probably the more effective thing in the bottom graph would be to just have a sentence that says that all data was equal to zero. So in general, you know, the more data you show up to a, up to the point where it's it's readable, the more interesting a graph can be. Um, here's another bad example, right? I think it would be much better just to have a sentence again saying that the you know that the data followed um, followed the line where y equals x or x equals y. Um, you know, and you can you can then take that same amount of information with a sentence here and, and put it in a much smaller space. Um, <coughs> making it communicate much more effectively. All right, so we can take that data density and then sort of add another principle, which is to um, increase the data to ink ratio. So that means sort of that you should have as much data as possible, but you should use as little ink or in the case of computers, contrast to represent that data. And both of these principles sort of come from Edward Tufte's work um, and some of the people who have written about it, like Howard Weiner. So of course, again, this is to a limit, you know, if we took away all the ink, then we would have an infinite data to ink ratio, but that's not what we want to do. You know, we want it to still communicate. Um, but so you can see here, we're looking at, you know, some line graphs and by adding the extra ink to make these 3D, the graphs essentially become unreadable. And you could, you know, you could imagine that this data is not too hard to see if they had been kind of standard, um, line, you know, if they had been sort of standard, a standard line chart, you would have much lower ink, but you would still have the same amount of data and they would actually be a lot easier to see. Um, and likewise, uh, this is my favorite graph of all time. 
um, but a very good example of how having very high ink to data ratio um, can make something very difficult to see what's going on. So oftentimes I, I show this example and I ask people, you know, sort of how we could, could communicate the same thing with less ink. And I think one of the best ways to do it would be to just sort of do it as a line chart, right? You could have each of these countries could be a line. Um, the x-axis could be year and the y-axis could be tons of banana exports. And I think we could see the data much more clearly than we can with this 3D chart. So, you know, the, the sort of this adding a, additional ink actually tends to take away from our ability to see what's going on with the data and understand it. So, <clears throat> all right. So the next thing I, I really like to encourage people is to think about using space over time. And by that, what I mean is that, you know, I think with, with all of the software we have now, there's a, there's a tendency to want to animate things. And I think, you know, animation and interactive visualizations can be really powerful. But at the same time, what makes data visualization so effective is that it takes a bunch of information and lays it out over space so that we can all at once kind of take it all in and find patterns. The problem with sort of laying things out over time is that it, it asks us to remember what had happened in the past rather than seeing everything at once. Um, and so I think actually the New York Times had two great examples of this. Um, and let me show, the, show, you to them, show you them really quickly. So they had these two graphs of, oh, let me see if I can click into it, there we go. Um, they had these two graphs of drought. And so here, let me make this full screen. Um, and so here's one that they made of drought in 2015, and they show it sort of by date. And you can see it moving around. And I think it's, you know, it's clearly a very nice map. Um, but the problem with it, at least for me, is that by the time I get to the end of it, I really don't remember what it looked like at the beginning. And so it's sort of, it's calls on us not to, you know, to see pattern. Well, in order to, to perceive patterns, we have to remember things rather than just see them. So uh, back here, so they have a, another example, which I think actually works much better. And this is, you know, what we might call small multiples. So this is looking at, I think it's drought in, severe drought by county in June. And you can see it goes all the way back to 1896. And you can very quickly sort of pick out here in 1934. Um, and throughout the 1930s, you can sort of see the dust bowl and these kind of things. And, you know, you could imagine this being animated, but the nice thing about having them as small multiples is our eyes can sort of jump around and find outliers and patterns in a way that would be really hard to do if we had to remember what each year looked like. So I think the more, you know, not that one should never animate things or something like that, but the more that one can use sort of space rather than time to show data, I think the more effective it is. Next, I think being um, really attentive to how data is sort of layered together and grouped together can really affect how communicative a data visualization is. So I know most of us don't drive around with uh, road, these old roadmaps in our car, but I think there's still such a nice example of how you can make even static data visualization sort of have a, a kind of a zoom effect to them. Right, because what these, these maps did so well is they sort of showed both the kind of the major highways and some of the surface level streets by varying the, the width of the lines and the same thing with major cities and minor cities by making, um, making the titles larger or smaller. These graphs or these maps had this way that you, know, you could sort of hold them at arm's length and see the entire state and the highways or you could pull out your magnifying glass and see some of the major surface roads. You know, and I think the more that you can kind of interact or um, use these sort of layering effects, the, the more you can actually increase the data density um, in a way that people don't get lost in your graphs. And so another really nice example of this um, that I like to show and, and people usually, you know, I think don't use too much anymore, but I think are such a, a nice example of this effect are stem and leaf plots. So for those of you 
um, who don't remember this from elementary school, on the, the left side of the bar is the stem. So this is the, the tens digit. And on the right is the, the leaf. So it's the, the ones digit. So our data set is something like 11, 15, 20, 24, 24, 26 and a half. Um, and I just pulled this from Google. This is uh, not actually a hot dog eating competition that I was involved in. Um, but the thing that I think is so nice about these stem and leaf plots is that effectively what we're looking at is a histogram, right? We can see the sort of the overall structure of the data, um, but at the same time, we can see the individual data points. So, you know, if your like cousin was, was involved in this hot dog eating competition, you could see exactly what, uh, <coughs> exactly where they ranked. And so it has this sort of similar zoom effect that you can see both general structure and individual data point. Um, they kind of messed it up by doing the 6.5. It sort of messes up the histogram effect, but you can get the, the general idea. Um, you know, and I, and I haven't found too many opportunities to use stem and leaf plots, but I still really love them. Um, and in fact, I was just the other day looking at um, Tukey's book on exploratory data analysis and was sort of surprised to see that the entire first chapter is all about various ways to use stem and leaf plots. Um, so I think that they're a nice example. And then finally, how we actually group data, if we're gonna sort of pull things apart and make multiple graphs, has a huge impact on what we can see and sort of what the data allows us to see. So this is a, a graph um, showing uh, income by, uh, by year based on uh, sex and then also based on educational attainment. And so the, the problem with this graph, I think, is that it, it actually really obfuscates the most interesting point, right? The most interesting thing about this data, I think, is actually the, the difference in, in pay by gender between the two graphs. But since they're on two separate graphs, it's actually really difficult to see that, and especially since they're on two different axes, you know, the one only goes up to 14,000 and the other one goes up to 20,000. It's really, really difficult to see that. So I think, you know, it, it sort of, it tells this other story about educational attainment um, that's hard to really see very much where the much in, more interesting story about um, sex discrimination in pay is hidden. And so I think if I were to redo these graphs, what I would recommend is actually maybe doing, five, you know, doing small multiples with five of them. So having one for each um, sort of line of educational attainment and then having male and female and maybe you could add in the median income in there as well um, or have that be a separate graph but then i think it would sort of it would bring to the fore the more interesting um, point of the data and so this kind of these questions about how you group and break things up um, can really impact what is shown in a data set Okay, so finally, um, you know, and, and I think this sort of goes without saying, but it's nice to see a few examples, and I, I love sort of teaching these, is that one should aim to be as accurate as possible in representing the data that you are working with. And there are all sorts of, you know, I think way pitfalls that one runs into in trying to represent data in this way. So the first thing is um, there's you know, I, I love how bad this graph is from Reuters. So you can see here, it's showing the number of gun deaths um, after Florida enacted its stand your ground law. Um, and it looks upon, you know, when you first look at it, it looks like the number of gun deaths go way down. But when you spend a few more seconds with it, it actually becomes clear that they went way up because the, the um, zeros at the top and then it goes down as it increases. And so while the, the graph isn't really, you know, lying per se, it's going against this sort of this standard idiom that we expect zero to be at the bottom. And as things increase, they should go up on the page as well. So, you know, it's important to kind of recognize the, the ways in which people are expecting data to be seen, um, you know, and not try to push against those too much. Obviously one can do, you know, interesting and innovative things, but if it, if it sort of reaches this point where it's really hard to read the graph, um, that can, can be a bad thing. Um, I don't know if, if any of you remember what happened to the Mars Climate Orbiter, but it was this um, orbiter that, was, that cost $125 million and was sent to Mars. And shortly after landing in Mars orbit, it crashed into the surface. 
And it was later revealed that the reason for this crash was that there were two teams, there were of, you know, of all the teams that were working on it, two teams who were passing data between each other, who were writing software to pass data between each other. One of them was using standard units and the other one was using metric units. And so it, you know, it, it didn't understand the data that it was getting um, and, and veered wildly off course. And so I think it's a, it's a nice um, and sort of expensive example of, you know, of how important it is to, you know, to, to know what data you're getting and what the data actually represents. Another story that I, I really like to, to tell students is about this farm in Kansas. And so you can see in the back, there is a, there's a farm there. And this farm is sort of in the middle of nowhere in Kansas. Um, you know, I think a mile from the nearest neighbor and a couple miles from the, the nearest town. And in the, the sort of the early 2000s, there was an old woman who was living in this farm and, you know, and renting this farm and had just a, a gateway computer, you know, and would go on maybe once a week to download pictures of grandkids or something like that. But she would keep getting visited from, uh, you know, local law or from law enforcement, the FBI would show up, people would show up and claim that she had scammed them or their relatives. Someone was, was so mad that they left a broken toilet in her, her driveway. Um, and the, the local law enforcement actually got to the point where they put up a sign at the end of the driveway that said, if you have a problem with this house, you know, please come talk to us first, um, before bothering this woman. Um, and, and no one really knew what was going on until a, a reporter started looking into it. And it turned out that what had happened was there was this company named MaxMind that in the early 2000s, um, started gathering data, trying to link IP addresses with geographic locations so you could make maps like this of where people were visiting your website from. And one of the things they decided to do was if they didn't, you know, so that they could encode it just with latitude and longitude, if they didn't know exactly where someone was coming from, you know, they thought it was just Michigan or the United States or something like that, they would put it in essentially the center of that geography and round it to two significant digits. So it just happened of the thousands and thousands of IP addresses that they only knew to the United States, they put them in the center of the country, which happened to be in Kansas, right where this woman's house was. And so anytime anyone got you know, spammed or hacked or anything like that from one of these thousands of IP addresses, people would go into this database, look it up, you know, then go to Google Maps and find out the address. So these thousands of IP addresses looked like they were coming um, from this poor woman's house. And so I think it's, you know, it's a really nice reminder that sometimes even though data is, you know, encoded in a specific way, it's important to know, you know, what the data actually represents and how it was collected because otherwise it's really easy to use it for purposes that it doesn't actually support. So the final sort of pitfall, I think, in working with data visualization speaks both to sort of the, the power and the danger of data visualization. Um, you know, data visualization is so sort of impactful, I think, because it plays on our human desire to find patterns and try to figure out, you know, why things interact. And so we're really good at detecting patterns, especially in, in visual space, and, but we're really bad at calculating probability in our head. So I love these examples from uh, this guy, Tyler Viggen has this website, Spurious Correlations. And he just throws in data set, you know, these sort of small data sets and it computes them, you know, he has a program that runs them against each other and tries to find correlations. And so this one is divorce rate in Maine correlates really well with per capita consumption of margarine. And every time I show this in the back of my head, I start thinking, well, you know, maybe if people aren't eating butter, then they're less happy in their relationships or something like that. But of course, you know, the real reason is just that there are enough data sets and, and some of them are going to align by random chance. Um, so, you know, I think it's a, it's a good reminder that even if things, you know, look really compelling uh, visually, we have to be careful of understanding sort of where they came from and the processes um, and the possibility that what we're seeing is just random chance rather than some actual causal relationship. Um, oh, and I think I have one more example here. Age of Miss America correlates with murders by steam, hot vapors, and hot objects. Um, 
So that's about all that I sort of have to, to share with you. But I think, you know, sort of in, in general, one of the things I, I think the kind of the major takeaway from all of this is that that visualization is, is such a kind of a, a rich field that touches on a lot of the sort of larger issues of, you know, of working with data and understanding data and teaching data. Um, and it's it's sort of a really fruitful space to try to encourage students and faculty and anyone else that we're working with to sort of step back and think critically about what the data is, how they're representing it, what they're doing with it, what it is that they want to do with it, and what they want to communicate with it. Um, so I, I hope that, you know, sort of some of these examples and thinking through the things in this way um, can be helpful for you all as you're working on, you know, teaching or whatever it is that you're doing with data visualization. Um, and we have, I think, about uh, maybe about 10, 15 minutes for questions. So I'd, I'd love to hear um, what you all think, and I, I'd love to answer any questions that you might have. So thank you. Thank you, Justin. That was fantastic. I just learned um, way more than I thought. I thought I kind of knew how to do data visualization, and uh, your expertise was truly helpful. Oh, thanks. Um, there are some questions that have come in. Um, I encourage you, if you have a question, to type it now because there's only a couple. And you know, when we run out, then we will probably close. So don't wait. Get your question entered into the question uh, box. Uh, our first question comes from Sarah Z. Uh, she asks, what unique roles can librarians play in teaching data visualization? Do you think compared to uh, faculties, programs, interest groups, and et cetera at a university, that data visualization is, a still, is still a new thing? Oh, sorry, I think I'm combining questions. So what can librarians do is the first question <coughs> in data visualization. Yeah, so I think that that's a, a, a great question. Um, you know, and I think, I think librarians can do a lot in terms of data visualization. You know, I think one of the, the really powerful things about being in the library and doing data visualization is that it sort of allows you to step outside of the kind of disciplinary constraints. Because, you know, we have a number of, of courses on our campus that teach data visualization, but they all sort of take such a kind of a specific disciplinary bent. I think they tend to kind of rush people into software too quickly. They tend to sort of, you know, build on the, the ways that people expect data to be visualized. So that the really nice thing about being in the library is I think you can, you know, you can work with um, faculty and students and sort of step back and ask what it is that they're trying to show. Um, you know, a lot of the, the consultations that I end up doing around data visualization tend to be people who are starting or trying to kind of work outside or beyond their disciplinary boundaries. So it's oftentimes people who say, you know, I have this concept in my discipline and I'm trying to explain it to people in this other discipline you know, can you help me figure out a good way to do that? And so I think the, you know, the library um, being this kind of place that's non-disciplinary can be really, really powerful for, for doing that kind of work. Um, the other thing, you know, and it's, it's not exactly what your question is, but, um, but I think is, is worth noting, um, you know, I think data visualization is sort of so exciting right now that I get a lot of people coming in who don't really understand the other data services that the library offers, you know, in terms of helping people find data or preserve data or these kind of things. Um, and with visualization, people usually come kind of early in projects. So it's a nice way also to just sort of get people in the library talking to other experts who do other things with data early in projects. Thank you. We also have a question from Winnie in Uganda. Um, she says that data visualization is a new thing uh, in libraries in her country. Um, are there uh, data visualization tools that are simple that could be used in libraries and specifically free data visualization tools that you would recommend? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's actually, we're at this really exciting moment right now where a lot of the, the sort of, there are a lot of both kind of simple free visualization tools, but there are also a lot of um, free, very powerful data visualization tools. So one of the things I like if I'm just doing like a really sort of, you know, kind of quick one-off um, example instruction session, but I want people to kind of play around with data is there's, um, it's called raw graphs. I think it's, it's raw graphs.io. 
Um, and it's just a website you can go and you upload like a, you just copy and paste a CSV there. And then it has a lot of like really interesting graphs you can make with it. So a lot of the things that like Excel won't allow you to make. So that's a, that I think is just a, um, you know, I, I don't use it a lot for actual production work, but it's kind of a fun thing for just playing around with people and getting, um, getting people playing around with data and getting people thinking about data visualization. Um, but other than that, you know, I mean, I use R a lot for data visualization. It's, it's not the easiest <laughs> software to use, um, but it is free and the, and the basic graphing functions in it are pretty straightforward. So one of the things I like to do when I'm teaching is to, to sort of either give people very clean data so that it's only a few commands to, you know, to graph things or show them how to clean up their data elsewhere, even if that's Excel or working directly on the CSV or something like that. Um, you know, using visualization in R, I think, can be both a nice introduction to visualization and a nice introduction to um, R. But there are also things like, you know, Python can do some nice visualization stuff as well. Good tip. Um, uh, let's see, Kelly Schultz, thank you for your presentation. Do you only do uh, data visualization training in specific classes or for assignments, or do you teach open workshops on these topics? And do you combine these topics again uh, with teaching for a specific tool? Yeah, <clears throat> no, that's a really good question. So when I, um, when I started doing visualization, I tried to do a lot of open workshops, and I actually found them really difficult because um, first of all, people would not really, people would come and they would think that they would want to sort of learn a really specific tool. So it was hard to do something like this, to have an open workshop that was just about principles. And then when I did teach a specific tool, the challenge was that, that people would come with such different skill levels. So, you know, I would have people who were struggling even to just download the sample files that we were working with. And then other people who, you know, if I was teaching one in R, say, you know, some people couldn't download the files and other people were actually like very, very skilled at R. And so they were waiting a lot. Um, so, so I found open workshops to be a little bit of a challenge, at least on, on my campus. Um, and I've, I've had much better luck with sort of in class sessions where it's sort of clear you know, that, that even if um, people have different skill sets, you know, sort of what kind of things they're working on, what assignments they're working on. Um, and then I can either, you know, use some software that, that integrates with what they're already doing in the class or teach sort of a more conceptual one um, that they can apply to whatever it is that they're doing. Um, you know, I'd really like to, to return to doing open workshops, but I think I have to spend some time experimenting and thinking about exactly what they would look like and, and how to make them effective for everyone. Okay, we still have a handful of questions to, to get through. Okay. Um, going back to the Florence Nightingale Coxcomb chart, do the wedges measure by length or area? Oh, that's a really good question. I don't actually remember. Um, I think it's by length, but I could be wrong about that. Um, somebody else is asking if you would provide references to the resources mentioned, such as the literature about data visualization. Maybe we can add that to the slides that go along with YouTube. Sure, yeah. Um, or even, you know, I, I think there are, there are only a few of them. I could also just go comment, you know, once it's up on YouTube, I can just comment them so they're right there. Okay. Um, when you are teaching um, applied data vis visualization tools, how do you use these best practices as a framework for teaching researchers to think about and think through the visualization decision? That's a, so one thing I really like to do is I like to find a data set um, that's messy but still has <laughs> some kind of structure in it and then sort of working with the tool to go through an iterative process. So starting with, you know, a graph that, you know, making like a scatter plot or something like that, that's largely unreadable and then talking, you know, and then sort of tweaking things over and over again until it, it sort of turns into something that is, you know, that makes sense and is readable. So that way they can both see a bunch of the different kind of ways that you can use the software, 
but then also how you know making these decisions along the way can take some data that's otherwise unintelligible and make it into something that's intelligible. All right, so scanning here. Um, I think are we maybe ah here we go. Uh, this is from Robert Choate. He asks, just as you might put too little or too much data into one visualization, what do you think the balance is for the number of visualizations to pique interest or draw people to your data? Oh, that's a really good question. You know, and I think one of the things that, that I think I, I didn't say, but I probably should have said, is that I think it's really important to sort of um, be aware of where and how it is people will be consuming your visualizations because you know if you have a powerpoint slide people obviously can't spend as much time with them as if it's in a report or something like that so i think the answer to that question is it's really dependent on the audience and the media through which they'll be confronting the visualizations yeah great and i know that robert actually works here at icpsr and so i think when we use visualizations um, alongside the data sets that we are disseminating, it is sort of to draw the user into, you know, looking at what else is in the data. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure that's a bit of the context around that question. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, in, in that sort of case, you know, just a, a few can be really powerful to just sort of, you know, get people interested and get some <laughs> sense of, of what the data is. Yeah, great. Well, I think I'm seeing the, the questions tapering off. Um, and it's perfect timing. It's, it's um, Eastern time, 1258. Um, so with, the, with that, with this last question that we had, um, I do want to thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon um, for some middle of the night if you're in our, in Sydney, I suppose, in that destination that we'll all be heading to shortly. Um, so thank you from time zones around the world for your terrific presentation. Um, thoughtful answers to questions, and uh, to the audience, thank you for being a great audience. Uh, the slides will come to you, and on the ISSist uh, listserv, I will share when uh, the recording is put up on our YouTube channel. Thank you, Justin. Thank you.